And, and my hope and heart with what we do today as we assemble here is that we're not going through emotions, but we're really questioning what are we doing, right? In the words of Dr. Phil, how's that working for you, right? How's that working for you? Is it effective? Is this really what it's meant to be? Is this, or if we were, my, uh, my wife told me we had a package to pick up in Oklahoma City. She had a package to pick up in Oklahoma City. I'm, I'm not going to throw under the bus here on purpose, but I've got to say this, okay? So I've got things going on. She's got them going on. She's wonderful. I, my wife's tremendous. As anyone that knows Rexanne know that she's able to accomplish so much. And I'm thinking, okay, I've got this day off. I took a vacation week last week. And she said, I've got to go pick up a package. And I'm thinking to myself, well, she's going to go by herself. I naturally want to go with her and be with her. I should go with her. It's a package. What time do we come home? <laughs> well, in all fairness, I had to go to the pharmacy. But the point is, we came home late, and it was a lot more. Because when you get there, what happens? I got to do this. Oh, we did, we, did, you, did you get this? Oh, man, I did, this would be better than this. So, and yeah, you got to grab something to eat. And it's, you know, it's m mom and dad are in the city, and there's not a kid with them. What do you want to eat? So anyway, the point is, we go to do all these things, and we're just, our minds are so focused on getting these things, and it keeps branching, and it keeps going, and the decisions keep rolling, and we're getting honked at because there's no parking spots, and we take a parking spot that this lady thought was her parking spot, but we didn't think she thought that, but, I mean, if she really wanted it, we would have drove further, but anyway, it's... What's going on? You know, we, we want to come here and really be challenged by the Lord to wonder what we're doing. Would you agree with that, sir? I think we should be challenged. I'm going to read to you from Mark. This is, this is something it says in the book of Mark. And Mark chapter 7, it says something here that's challenging. If my phone will cooperate. It says in Mark chapter 7, verse 6, He answered and said to them, How well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written? What is this season about? Christmas. It's about Christ's birth, right? Just kind of think about this. He answered and said to them, How, well, how did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Verse 8, laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that we're commanded to work to have Christmas, but every day is Christ's day. Amen? Every day is a day to serve Him. And if you think of all the effort we in our Western culture spend trying to buy, and I'm not against buying things. I'm not one of those Christians like so many are who say you can't have Christmas, you can't have any holiday because there's a, a pagan link to it. Um, it's actually not. No, he came to redeem all and to own all because it's all his. It's all his. We are his, right? And, it's, and I just want us to be challenged. Would you agree with that? Amen. I, I, I think it's very easy for us to get caught up into the celebration of the giving, the gift giving, you know, looking forward to buying gifts for our families and looking forward to receiving gifts from our family. And uh, how many of you look forward to the days off of work? <laughs> yeah. You look forward to just being at home. And, and uh, I know the mothers and the, the, those who are preparing the meals and stuff, they don't always look forward to that. But so for some people, this is just a joyous time of the year. They love the the winter part of it, they love the lights, they love all that it means 
to be with your family and, and to have that nostalgic Christmas because we all want to, uh, whether we believe it or not, we all want to reach back into our past and bring forward all of those good things that we remember as a kid growing up about Christmas. And we want to, our children, we want our family to experience those things. And uh, when Rex Ham was talking about, are we, you know, will we go through Christmas and not have anything uh, that is eternal, that is focused on Christ? Will we not have those things? I can't remember growing up as a young man really focused on any of that. You know, uh, even in my 20s and my 30s, and, and even in the, now that I'm getting ready to enter into my 50s, but even in the 40s, you know, that hasn't always been the focus of my heart is to focus on the eternal aspect of what Christmas means. Now, we know we leave legacies. We need leave those memories with each other. But I'm talking about something that's long-lasting. Right. And I think often what we forget is a lot of times the, the traditions and the things that we focus on because we want and desire them so much, we can miss what God really wants in the here and now. And we can miss what he really wants to speak to us, as Pastor was saying in that passage. The word of God says that it's the traditions of men that make the word of God to no effect. And sometimes our traditions can be held up higher than what Jesus is really speaking to our hearts right now. And I don't think, um, I want to be one of those people as we move forward and as we mature that wants to miss what Jesus is really saying to our hearts right now. And again, not being legalistic and saying you can't have that type of Christmas, but just saying focus and the point of it being Jesus. Right. Where's your heart at in the middle of all of it? Because it's supposed to be about him. If it wasn't a holiday that was supposed to be about him, then I don't think that it would be a perversion. I don't believe it would be wrong. But it is supposed to be about him. It's Christmas, the masses of the church coming together to be thankful for the gift of Christ. And I want us to look at Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Such beautiful poignant and powerful verses about the Lord Jesus Christ and the gift that Christ is. From Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is so rich and so full. Think about the gift that Jesus is to us. You could break this down and it would take a while. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's so rich and full. The whole purpose of this holiday that we're going into, and, it, you know, it's, it, it isn't just one day. It, we get aggravated, but really, historically speaking, Christmas, originating largely in Europe, was a season. And it was a season to celebrate Christ and the gift of Jesus Christ. It is something that, as we've talked about before, I love to talk about holidays and how they are taken for Christ because that's really the way it works is the world, us and our nature, do the very thing that I'm complaining about to you today. We take things and we naturally, by the leading of the enemy, take them and use them negatively, even though they were meant for God. It's just like going to church. It can become religious. You can be completely wrong in your heart even though you're going through the motions. And that's the way Christmas can be. We can be completely wrong in our heart, but we're going through things. And we spend so much time and stress in our Western culture with Christmas that how many people would be honest in this room, please raise your hand, if you dread Christmas in some way. 
Y'all are going to participate? Yes. It's, we literally dread it because we feel obligated, not out of a heart of desire, but out of a, 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 a burden, right? We are burdened to do something that really isn't necessary. It's not necessary for everyone to have all these gifts, right? But that becomes the center. That becomes the focus. Um, Christmas originally in Europe, where it really took off, and where so many cultures of the world get their information or get their adaption from, was pagan in its origin. There were pagan, there was a number of them. The Romans had, the Germans had, the Jews had, and other pagans had their own specific holidays, all that were around Christmas time. And when the Christians showed up on the scene, they realized something, that this is meant for Christ. You may have it wrong, but Christ can redeem it and restore it. And that needs to be our heart today. Our heart today needs to be, okay, we've got all this wrong in our traditions and our stresses, but Christ can take it back. Christ can take it back. That's what they did. If you want to study pretty much any Christian holiday that we celebrate, from what I understand, probably all of them were an instance where the church showed up in a land among pagans, in a land among people who didn't believe, and the church says, you know what? Christ bought this culture. He owns these people, and we're going to take them for him. That's what happened. And so, in turn, they would take the culture, they would preach Christ, and they would show how things could represent Christ because the Bible shows clearly that things in our culture and things in our world are, are very often symbolic and representative of God. Right? A number of things that were going on that we used in, Eastern, in, in Europe, in Western Europe, is there were evergreen trees that were being used by the pagans. There were candles. There was holly that were put all over the place. The color red was used as a, as a decoration, and gifts were being exchanged. See, all those things were going on, and these people showed up with a passion for Jesus. The Christians showed up. People turned Christian, and they looked and said, you know what? Christ didn't come to wipe the slate clean and to do away with these people in their culture. He came to redeem it. Amen? You know, uh, those things didn't happen just overnight. No. What, those things occurred as a result of individual encounters with Jesus. And individual encounters with Jesus leads people to begin to change their hearts, Amen. change their ways. And then they're, they begin to affect and influence those that are around them. Uh, if, we, if you look at... Uh, Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 28, you look at Jacob. Jacob is, he is a twin, right? He, is, he has his own idea and way that he wants to go and the things that he wants to do. And what happens in, Jacob 20, uh, in Genesis 28, he has an encounter. He has a dream, and he begins to dream about heaven, a ladder, Right? Up and down, he sees uh, angels of the Lord moving up and down in his ladder. And he gets up and he wakes up. And here's what, what's, what I find interesting about what Jacob says. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. Hmm. I didn't know it. I did not know that the Lord was in this place. Have you ever been in a place in your life where the presence of the Lord, once you'd known the presence of the Lord, then you didn't know it? There was a moment in time where you've drifted, where you, didn't where you didn't experience the presence of God like you once felt it. If you look throughout the scriptures, you'll see men and women again and again having encounters with God. Uh, Pastor Jack just talked about Isaiah. Isaiah is a good example of that. Isaiah chapter 6, uh, in the year of King Uzziah died, Isaiah sees the Lord. And he sees him in the temple, and his train fills the temple, and he has an encounter with the holy God. 
and his lips are touched and he realizes who he is in the, midst of, in, that, in the middle of that moment. He realizes where he stands in life. If you move just to the very next ver, ver, uh, chapter, in, in chapter 7, it's revealed that uh, there's going to be someone who's going to come of a virgin birth who's going to set things right. In the very next, and then as Pastor said, in, in Isaiah 9 as well, he talks about him being born. The, the key here is what I'm trying to explain is, is that God's desire has always been to reveal himself and to be God with us. Yes. That's what Amen. his desire has always been, to be God with us. In Luke chapter 5, you see it with Peter. You see Peter on the boat, and he goes out into the deep, and Jesus doing what Jesus does, ministers to Peter right where he is. He's a fisherman, and he, and he, over, he just takes over his, uh, uh, his way of doing things, and he shows that in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. And, he, and Peter is astonished. The Bible says that Peter falls to his knees in the boat, and he says, depart from me, for I'm a sinner. For I'm, I, depart from me, for I'm evil. I'm, in, I'm, I'm a wicked man. I'm, I'm, depart from me, because he realizes that this is a holy God. If you look throughout the scriptures, the woman at the well, you look at Paul when he's in prison, an angel of the Lord coming and, and setting the ground shaking and the change breaking, experience after experience after experience, all we see throughout the scripture is God saying, I'm here and I'm among you and I'm with you. And that is his desire from the start, is to be among us and to be with us. You know, one of my favorite things that Jesus said to them is he said to them, I will make you fishers of men, right? So in, in line with what he's saying is he redeemed and said, I can adapt you and what you know to what I've called you to be. He has the ability to adapt every one of us right where we're at with the skills that we don't value, that we don't even understand the gifts that we have. I can tell you the church of Jesus Christ has no idea the gifts that we've been given by the Spirit. I just really believe that with my whole heart, my whole heart, that we don't know the gifts that we have because we don't know who we are. And he says to Peter there, I will make you fishers of men. I will adapt you to my calling. And that's really what Christmas started as, and that's what we need to make Christmas again today. We need to make Christmas where we take it back for Christ. You can't have Christ without Christmas, not the real way it's intended to be. And I think that, you know, Going back to the point I made earlier, first to think about this, there's people who, there's two sides of this. There's, there's a road and a balance by the Holy Spirit down the middle, and there's two sides to the ditch. On one side of the ditch, people say, we're not going to have Christmas at all. For you and your family, that's not my business. But understand what I'm saying, please. For the church, we can have Christmas. But on one side, people say, we'll have no Christmas at all. And on the other side, there's people who say, it doesn't matter. And they just go ahead and have it, and they don't try to make Christ the center of what they're doing. We, last week on Sunday, we came and had a great service at church. I know it was a little chaotic with power and things, but I enjoyed it. I had good service at church, and then went to a family Christmas. And I came home to do it to my four bedrooms. My, each one of my four kids has their own bedroom. And in the evening, I want to reflect with them. I do this all the time to sit down with each one of them, pray with them, talk to them about their day and what they learned from it, what God's speaking to them and through their hearts. And I said, okay, each one of them separately, was anything eternal really going on today, do you think, in most of our hearts? Was anything, as Pastor said, of eternal consequence? Did we spend time with the Lord, really? Did we... Did what we do with our Christmas party have anything to do with Jesus, really? Or was it more about gifts and, and family? And those things are fine. There's nothing wrong with gifts and family. But we're calling it Christmas. We're calling it, we're saying it's about Christ. We're going through emotions thinking it's about Him. And each one of my kids said, not really. Not really. We, I... They said to me, and I'm paraphrasing, we didn't see a whole lot of God and time learning about God, being with God, praying to God in what we did. Because we went to church for an hour, hour and a half, if you consider worship, if you make it to worship. And, and then we went to a party for a couple of hours, and then we spend time eating, 
exchanging gifts. Where's the eternal consequence, eternal significance in that? See my question? And I think it's important that we question. I, you're in a church that says, this is what we do. If you're with me at all, you know if we both do this. We're always questioning, and we believe it's the leading of the Holy Spirit. Why do we do what we do? Is there really Christ in what we're doing or not? Is this really his church? Are we coming to go through motions and to practice religiosity? Or do we come to experience Emmanuel? Do we come to experience Jesus? And I think that it's very important that we, we do what they did, as I referenced earlier in the ancient church, take the culture for Christ. Take back our family, our personal lives first before we start preaching. As it says in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Before you can take the plank out of your brother's eye, once you, or the speck in your brother's eye, how about you get the plank out of your own? Right? So the first thing is for ourselves to pray to the Lord to redeem us and to set our hearts right, and then our family, and then our culture. You agree? I agree so much. I you know, there's, there comes a turning point in a lot of our lives that make us focus on Him. And I, I, I don't want to mess with any of your theology. I just want to say what the Word says. Mm -hmm. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. Amen. That means that God saw it coming. And sometimes that means that it's even allowed, it's allowed and directed by God. For a turning point, for a point that you come to and you realize, hey, I'm at life, I'm at the edge of this thing. It's no, it's either I'm going to continue on and, and lose everything, or I'm going to turn. Things got to be turned around, and I have no power in doing it except to yield myself to the Lord, to yield myself completely to Him. So. I say that because yesterday morning I got a call, a call from Mary Brown here in town, many of you know her, and uh, her nephew who was like my brother uh, had a stroke yesterday, he's 40, 44 years old, and had a stroke and fell flat on his face in this in his, at his house on, con on the tile floor, cut his face open, and, and uh, he's in the hospital right now. And um, you look at that moment, and, and you know, the, all of the responses, you know, you, you, you reach out to family, and you, need, you ask yourself, do I need to go to San Antonio, and do I need to be there for him? And, and uh, fortunately, I was able to call and speak to him, and yes, his speech was slurred, and he wasn't quite all there, but I was able to hear his voice, and I was able to minister to him over the phone. And, and in the moment, I'm getting ready to go celebrate my father-in-law's birthday. All the family's been called in, and it's easy to get caught up in that. Today's my wife and I's anniversary, and it's easy to get caught up in all of these things and just overlook and miss a point that people are going through things in their own lives. Yeah. And yes, this is a season that we celebrate, but it's also a time that we have to roll back other things and focus on people that really need for us to take a moment, for us to drop what we're doing, for us to leave it, to push everything aside and to go and to share the love of God as we're called to do. And so I, I just, I just want to say that God orchestrates things in our lives sometimes for us to come to a point where we have no one but the Him to rely on. Exactly. Not, no one but Him Amen. to focus on and to bring us out. And then that changes our focus. It changes our perspective. It changes our outlook on what we value in a day, specifically this day. It changes the way we look at things. How many of you have gone through things this year that has changed your perspective on life? change your perspective and brought things back to the center of where they should be, where it's focused on Jesus and not on yourself. It doesn't mean that those things in your life stop. It doesn't mean that I didn't go to my father's birthday party. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to do something to celebrate our anniversary. But what it does mean 
is that I have an understanding that this means something, but the, it's the greater part of it is me being who I say I am in Christ. That's right. Means allowing him to use me as he desires to use me, not just to do those little things that come and go, but do those things that mean something to someone else, to bring them life, to be there for them, to be an example, to have Jesus move on our hearts and our lives. I hope that makes sense. It does. It's about giving. And that's what this is really about for most people listening to me. Have you been focused on anything more than the gifts? No, right? It's all about the gifts. That's what this whole thing is for the last week or two or month. Everybody's focused on gifts. And as Pastor's saying, it's more blessed to give than to receive, right? It's more blessed to give, and there's no greater gift to give than Christ. I, this is the second or third um, Sunday before Christmas that when they, they did their play, and I asked to have this up here because this is the center of Christmas. The baby that laid in this is the very center and purpose of all that we should be doing. The center of our very lives should be the little baby, the, the, the Emmanuel, God among us, that laid in this box that was like this, or maybe it was worse. I'm sure it was worse. It was a trough, is what many say historically, that he laid in, that had the animal slobber and the grain dust. It's crazy that God sent his son, and for the humility of the heart of the Father, that he would pick that baby, the perfect lamb of God, and lay him in a manger like that to show the brokenness of God for us. I think we should be broken this Christmas. If you want to give a gift this Christmas, give brokenness, a broken heart to God that he can build you back up and restore you. Be broken for him. Pray for our culture. All too often the enemy, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus said. Destruction is the greatest level. Killing is the middle, but the first part is the stealing. He has come to steal from the church the meaning of Emmanuel, Christ among us. And he's doing a really good job if you look at the amount of time and effort and money and focus that we spend on all these other things that are not necessary. It's okay to do some of those things, but when that's our heart and that's what consumes us, we need to check our hearts, amen? amen. We need to think about gifts. We need to think about I want to talk to you about three important things about a gift to consider this Christmas season because everybody's running around and buying all these gifts and spending all this money and and I know all about it I've been right in the mix with you I'm not I'm not a hypocrite here I I know how we worry about these things and they become a focus but let's th I want to talk to you about three important things about a gift to consider this Christmas as you spend all this time and all this money pursuing the perfect gift you know you don't just buy something my wife says I'm terrible sometimes I do get it right I'm not trying to be mad at me on my wife today. She's great. But sometimes I, I try to buy things that are just simple, that I can appreciate. I'm a guy. I'm like, buy this tool. And she's like, what? No, that's not nice enough. And I'm like, no, this is great. It's simple, but it's great. And if I got it, man, I would be happy with it. See, for me, a certain gift is something simple and reusable to me. An electronic, when I was a kid, and I came home my first Christmas with my Nintendo 8-bit in 1980, 85, I think, from Walmart. I'll never forget that day, right? And it consumed me. If you buy me an electronic today, there's very few of anything electronic that I want. I want something that lasts and something that's not going to be obsolete within, you know, 360 days, yeah. right? But everybody's got a specific gift that they want. And everybody differs, but this gift of Christ is the perfect gift. You know, we're trying to pursue these perfect gifts for the right person. This is the gift for us to give people this Christmas. Just think about people come to your house and they open a bunch of boxes. The kids come down and they open these boxes. And there's nothing but air in them. They're, they're empty like a prank. Just imagine what would happen. Ever be Billy like, what? Where's the gift I got you? The husband says to the wife, I got you something, but it's not in the box. Everybody goes, wait a minute, where's all this stuff? And we sh what if that happened? 
Because the Lord wanted to show us by his grace and mercy that all that didn't matter. Would that be a, would that be a good gift from God? It could be if your heart was right, amen. It could be a good gift. Well, here's what three things about a gift. The gift speaks volumes. It speaks three different things. The first thing about a gift is it speaks about the giver. Number one, a gift speaks about the giver. It reveals information about the giver. Secondly, a gift speaks about the recipient. The gift shows information and desires and wants and needs about the recipient. And lastly, the gift and its value is the last part. It is meant to be intended for a specific person, of, okay, with an intrinsic value and a large worth. If, has anyone ever seen Oprah when she gave away her gifts? You ever seen that before? And I think Ellen does that now, is that right? Where people show up in the crowd and they do. Have you seen how those people act? Pretty crazy, right? They go wild. You think they're going to body slam and suplex the next person. I mean, they're wigging out, foaming at the mouth almost. They are so ecstatic about a trip, about a toy, about an item. But when it comes to the things of God, how do we act? If you took those people and they were told and they really perceived, and the same for all of us, if we really perceived in our heart the value of Christ Jesus and eternal life, we would never be the same, Pastor. You know, that's what it, that's what it comes down to is understanding how to discern what's good, what's acceptable, and what's the perfect will of God for our lives. Why? Because it's easy for us to be conformed to this world, it's easy for us to be focused on what the world puts an emphasis on and values. But when we have the Word of God Amen. and we have the Spirit of God, He ministers to us and He says there's so much more. Amen. I, I was I was talking to my wife the other day and I asked her, I wonder how many miles you scrolled <laughs> on our phones with our thumbs. And I wonder how many miles we've walked with our feet for the sake of Jesus Christ. Hmm. I bet we could probably say that for most of us, we've probably scrolled more miles with our thumbs than we have with our, and walked with our feet for Christ. Hmm. Because it's so easy for us to set our affections on earthly things. Everyone wants that gift. You know, what Pastor Zach was saying is that when someone gives you a gift and you know you're exchanging gifts, how many of you do the gift exchanges in your family, right? We do a gift exchange in our family. So, so when I give someone a gift and I'm thinking about them, I'm considerate and I'm really tr trying to think of something that I would like and I want to give to them, you know, and someone just says, here's a gift card, <laughs> you know, and it's like to macaroni grill or something. I don't even like cheese. You know? But, but you, you immediately go to the place of comparing what you just gave to what you're receiving, right? We immediately go to that place. Well, you know what? You, when it comes to the gift that God has given us in his son, Jesus Christ, there's nothing that we can compare it to. There's nothing that we can hold up and say, but. Right. Amen? Right. Because the only thing we can do is from that point on, all we can say is, I'm giving this because of what he did for me. Amen. That's the comparison that we make now, is that, you, I, yes, I know it's great, and I know all of that, but think about what he did for us. Amen. How much greater it is for That's why I'm giving you this, because of what it represents. Pastor Zach talked about not being a good gift giver. I think most men fall in that category. Not every man, but most men do. I can remember giving my wife a set of pots for her, for her, for her anniversary. That says a lot about the giver. <laughs> that says a lot about the giver and what he thinks about the recipient. And I was younger then, and thank God I've grown up a lot. 
because she let me know right then and there, uh, bless your heart. <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, she wasn't happy with that gift. And here's, I say this because it's so easy for us to get offended in this society and the culture that we live in right now and not to be thankful and grateful, but it's also easy for us to not be able to accept a voice of dissent and someone to say, that's not it, honey. <laughs> That, that's, that doesn't meet the mark, right? It may meet it for you. Pots may get it for you, but it doesn't get it for me. And we have to understand that when we are focused on individuals, we have to consider themselves, them above ourselves. Right. We have to consider them greater than we consider ourselves. And if we do that, we won't miss that mark. We won't miss that opportunity. And furthermore, if it's Christ-centered, you're always going to hit the mark. You're always going to give them exactly what they want. Amen? Because there's nothing greater than Christ. Nothing. There's no, no greater gift than Christ. And that's what we should focus on giving people and sharing with people. So back to my three points. Please remember these, that a gift speaks about the giver. So think about Isaiah 9, 6, if they'll pull that back up for us again. Think about this. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We had to have him. If we didn't have this gift, we, we were, we're dead in the water. There's no righteousness in us, right? There is none righteous. Finish it for me, Adam. No, not one. There is none righteous. No, not one. That means we have no way to be with the Father. So it takes the love of the Father to give His only Son. I don't, I don't know how the Father did it. I don't know how He did it. I don't know how people, I, I don't know how people give their children like that. I don't, I don't know how the Father did that. But He gave us. It speaks about the Father in the gift of the Son. And it speaks about the receiver, how we have to have Christ. We have to have Him. This culture has to have Christ. I, I think it perpetually, and I don't mean this in a negative way, I'm just being honest, it's just getting worse. It's just getting worse as we go along in our culture. We focus less and less on Christ, and the sad part of all is we think that we're doing Christian things, and we think we're being Christian, but the fact is our heart is far from God. And, this, and think about the value of the gift, the last part of the gift. How much value is in Christ? When you want to give someone a gift, I want you to be challenged. Please search your heart. I want you to pray this prayer with all earnesty, okay? I want you to say this. Don't say it right now, but I want you to do this later. I want you to go home, and I want you to say to the Father, the gift of Jesus I know in my heart is the greatest gift of all. Help me know how to give him away to everyone in my life. You can't, we can't make enough money this Christmas to give everybody something. You know, I, anybody familiar with, okay, do we still give this to this person because they're going to give this to us? Uh, what do I do because they're grown up and they left? Do I leave this gift with this person? You know, we've got our minds more focused on that than giving Christ Jesus. That's a fact. We need to focus on giving Christ Jesus. We need to look unto him as the greatest gift of all. Amen. So the other place I wanted to go with Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. And I wanted to look at this gift of Jesus. We looked at it in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, and looking at Isaiah, or Matthew 1, 21 to 23. And it says, she, she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, which means salvation. His name is salvation. And he shall save his people from their sin. There's not one person with one need. As we try to figure out these gifts, like, is this person going to need this gift? Is this applicable? Are they going to like it? Is it going to work? Do we give them the gift receipt back that they can take it back if it's dysfunctional or if it doesn't fit? You don't have to worry about all that. You don't have to worry about that when it comes to Jesus Christ. His name is complete salvation. If you look at that word in the original Greek, Jesus, it means 
He is your everything, your complete redemption. He is your everything. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. Everybody in here should try to do a backflip right now when you get the revelation of what that is. And it says in the next verse, so, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God with us. What a gift we have in Jesus. Every one of us should be challenged, Pastor, to pray that we can give Jesus through our prayers and through the opening of our mouths and through our actions this season. Amen? Will you all pray with me, please? Let's go to the Lord about such an issue that's such a heavy burden on our hearts. Father God, we ask you in Jesus' name to help us give Jesus this season. We want to take our culture for Christ. We want to get away from all the stuff, all the hustle and bustle. We want to come after Jesus Christ. We want that little baby in the manger to be the center of our lives, Heavenly Father. We know that we've messed up, and we know it's not just our fault. It's the enemy creeping in slowly. So we ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, to help us. We ask you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, to take our culture back. If we're Christians, and most of America is Christian, I don't know, Father. <laughs> if this is Christian, and people honk and steal and fight over gifts, I don't know what Christ would be like then. We ask you, Father God, to take back our culture. We ask you, Father God, to send your Holy Spirit into your church. We ask you, Father God, to help us individually. Help us to have Christ in Christmas this week. We ask you, Father, to redeem us. We your great redeemer, Jesus Christ. We need your help, Lord God. We've messed this all up. We have flat out messed this up. And only, and only salvation, salvation in itself, itself Jesus, Jesus can, save can save us. Only you can save us, save us Lord God. Let me let let be challenged this week, week as, they as, they eat, eat, as they share, share to exchange gifts, to share to share Jesus, to speak of his name, name, to love on love him, to share to share him, to come after him, to pray to pray to him, to seek to seek him. Please, Father God, help us to seek you. Please take Please back, take this, back season. this season. We surrender to you this day. I pray, I pray Father, that every, every person who listens to my lengthy my prayer, prayer, prayer and my rambling will get this part, this part that they cannot, they cannot do it without, without Jesus. Jesus. We cannot we do this without, without you, Lord. We need, we need you to need take our culture. culture. We need we it so badly. We are a house of prayer, but Father, the fact is most people who come and sit in here on a Sunday have difficulty praying for 90 seconds if they're, if they're without their mind shifting towards other things. That's just a fact. Most people that sing my voice, Heavenly Father, have the inability to pray for two or three minutes. And if I ask them to pray publicly, they would be ashamed or embarrassed because their walk with you isn't where they need it to be. But we call this Christmas. We think that we're going to come together and celebrate Jesus by spending a lot of money and worrying We need your help. I'm lengthily praying to you. I'm praying to you, Father, from the bottom of my heart. As this man stands beside me who loves you too, as pastors, as leaders, as elders of Oasis Church, we ask you, Father, to start right here, right now with this culture. In western Oklahoma, in this little town. Start right here, Father God. Make our hearts on fire for Jesus. Make our hearts burn with passion. For the only one who can save us and save our culture and save our world. Please, Father, take over. Take us over. Train us in your word. Make us a people of prayer. Make us a people of the word. We ask these things humbly and wholeheartedly 
in the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and praise you. Amen. We sure love you all and thank you for coming today. And we ask you to please come Saturday night if you have time. Please come. Did I say Saturday? Tuesday night, Christmas Eve, 6, 6 p.m. here at Oasis. Please come. If you want to be involved in any way, some people are already lined up to do some things. But if you want to be involved in any way with singing, get with Rick Sand. Have a blessed week. Amen.